Okay, we ended last week, we were looking at uh, the Gospel of John chapter 18, verses 1 to 11. And that's during the night time. That's when Judas, he brought the Jewish temple police with a backup of Roman soldiers to arrest Jesus in the garden. And when Jesus stepped forward, remember they say, we're looking for, who we live for, Jesus of Nazareth. And when Jesus stepped forward and identified himself by saying, I am, which in the context means I am he, but he says, I am. Well, the temple, pol- the temple police were taken aback to such an extent that they fell over one another. And then the scene repeats with the temple police having regained their composure. And after Jesus identifies himself again, he says, so if you seek me, let these men go. And he's protecting his disciples and thereby fulfilling what he had said in chapter 17, verse 12, that he did not lose any of his disciples. The exception of Judas having been previously mentioned isn't repeated. And his protection of these disciples physically here fulfills the protection of them spiritually that he'd mentioned in chapter 17, verse 12, as a symbol or an illustration of that protection. So he had promised there the protection of them, and here he's protecting them physically as a symbolic fulfillment of that statement of protecting them spiritually there. And then Peter draws his sword and he cuts off the right ear of the high priest servant named Malchus. Now this event, it's reported in all the Gospels. All the Gospels report this event, but Luke and John specify that it was the servant's right ear that was cut off, but only John gives the name of the servant. He lets us know that it's Malchus, and only Luke reports in Luke chapter 22, verse 50, 51, that Jesus immediately heals the servant's ear. Now that may explain how the disciples were allowed to, to escape rather than be attacked immediately by the armed soldiers, right? I mean, you can see you got a group of people here that come into a and He pulls his sword out and hits this guy. And you can see you know, these, these armed guys going, okay, it's on. And I can see Jesus very quickly going, you know, no harm, no foul. All right, so you let them go, and he heals them immediately. And that explains to me, see, how that would have gone down and how you could have possibly had them just be allowed to go ahead and leave. Now, Cruz suggests that what was motivating Peter was he was defending Jesus' honor from the shame attached to an arrest. But Jesus tells Peter to put his sword back into into its sheath, he's committed to drinking the cup that the Father has given him. He's committed to that. He's committed to bearing the sin of the world on the cross and all that's involved in that. So what he says here, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? He's committed to that. All right, chapter 18, verses 12 to 27. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, that's Caiaphas, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, Caiaphas, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you're also not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I've spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. 
Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Now, Annas, you see I have this in brackets because I've modified the English Standard Version here. Now, Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked him, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once, a rooster crowed. So Jesus is bound, and he's first sent to Annas. He's sent to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who is the high priest. And in Mark chapter, 5, Mark chapter 14, verse 50, it notes that all the disciples fled. But as John soon explains, Peter and another disciple... Uh, probably John, circled back at some point and then followed the arresting group. And as D.A. Carson comments in his commentary, he says that the Jewish officials were the primary arresting officers. You remember I, I suggested to you last week that there was this contingent of Roman soldiers kind of as a backup. He says that the Jewish officials were the primary arresting officers is clear from the fact that Jesus is brought to Annas and then to Caiaphas. The Roman auxiliaries, their role of preventing trouble complete, doubtless returned to their barracks in the fortress of Antonio. And that seems right to me because you don't hear anything else about them. Now, Annas, he served as the high priest. He, he served from A.D. 6 to A.D. 15. But Caiaphas was the high priest when Jesus was arrested, holding that office of high priest from A.D. 18 until A.D. 36 or 37. So I believe this is happening in 30. Some people believe it's happening in 33. But either way, the high priest is Caiaphas. Now, Annas, he continued to be influential as a patriarch of a high priestly family. And a high priest like Annas still could be spoken of as the high priest in an honorary or a de facto sense. As you see in Luke chapter 3, verse 2, and Acts chapter 4, verse 6. But John, it's important to see that John nowhere identifies Annas as the high priest. He's quite clear about who the high priest here is. He twice specified previously that Caiaphas was the high priest that year in 1149 and 1151. And he does so two more times in this context, stressing that the high priest is Caiaphas. He refers to Annas as the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Okay? So though you could refer to Annas, and some people have referred to Annas as a high priest, that's not how John does it. He's clear that the high priest is Caiaphas, and as Robert Gundry says in his commentary, he says, and it's important to note that though Annas had been the high priest earlier, and even though ex-high priests continued to be called high priests, you could in an honorary or de facto sense, John hasn't called Annas a high priest. He's called only Caiaphas the high priest and stressed Caiaphas as being high priest that year, almost as if to rule out a continuing designation of Annas as high priest, or at least our thinking of him as such. So the courtyard is that of the high priest Caiaphas, not of Annas, and the high priest in the following verses continues to be Caiaphas. And I think that's important for reading this in line with the synoptics that you understand, and I'll talk about how, how to understand verse 24. But, but really the, the scene is in, before Caiaphas. He takes him to Annas, Annas quickly sends him over to Caiaphas, and all the material things are happening there in the courtyard and where and before Caiaphas. So it, it seems that, that what's, what's going on, it seems therefore that Annas 
He probably, he's brought there and then he sends him promptly over to Caiaphas. And then that's belatedly noted in verse 24. And I'm going to say a bit more about that. And that the events then in, in verses 15 to 27, they relate to Jesus' appearance before Caiaphas. You could get the impression reading that, that this interrogation, everything's being conducted by Annas, but I think that's wrong. I think this is happening in front of Caiaphas. Again, Gundry says in 18, 13 to 14, John identified Annas as the father-in-law of Caiaphas. That mention of Caiaphas then led John to fast forward to Caiaphas' interrogation of Jesus, during which Peter denied Jesus for the first time. And I think that's what's, that's what's going on. And a fellow named Kermit Zarley, who, who has a, a harmony of the Gospels, Interesting, he's a former PGA golfer, by the way. But uh, Kermit Zarley says, if Annas was the high priest to whom belonged the courtyard in verse 15, if that's the case, and Annas was Jesus' interrogator in verses 19 to 23 as well, it's incredible that John would mention an interrogation of Jesus by Annas but none by Caiaphas when all three synoptists mention the interrogation by Caiaphas and Peter's three denials there in his courtyard, but do not mention Annas. Okay, so this is, you're wondering, why is he spending time talking about this? I'm spending time so when you read other things, you'll see how these fit together. Okay, he says, it is therefore safer to regard John as the only evangelist who records Annas' preliminary custody of Jesus in verse 13. According to this view, there's no indication that Annas even questioned Jesus before the beginning of the Sanhedrin's investigation led by Caiaphas in verses 19 to 23. And I think that's in fact what's going on. Now, under this view... Right? 18, chapter 18, verse 24 is a, as as, uh, J. Ramsey Michael says, is a belated clarification, okay, to the effect that, of course, Annas, to whom Jesus had first been taken, had by this time sent the prisoner along to the real high priest, his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And you say, well, how can 1824 be taken that way? All right, English Standard Version and probably the version that you're looking at will have something like, Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Okay, well, if you read it that way, obviously it sounds like all of this other stuff has happened before Annas and then Annas sends him to Caiaphas. But the way the King James had rendered it, it says now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. You say, well, what's that about? All right, well, the the verb here, it's an aorist tense and a legitimate way to render the aorist tense. Normally, you would do it this way. Normally, it would simply be like a parallel of our past, then sent. But you can also legitimately render that, that tense of that verb as a pluperfect. So you could render it this way. In fact, J. Ramsey Michael says... He, he, he says that it is, is, quote, quite legitimate. And of course, the King James people wouldn't have done it if it was. He says it's quite legitimate to render it that way. And D.A. Carson says it's a possible reading. And Wilbur Pickering, in his book that is titled Identification of the New Testament Text, he says, John saw that his readers could get the idea that Jesus was still with Annas. And so he wrote verse 24 to avert that misunderstanding. Verse 24 should be translated in parentheses. Annas had sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And I think that's right because it's obvious to me how he's using high priest that he's clearly in front of Caiaphas. And so then he goes back and says, obviously, uh, Annas had previously sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. So I think that's that's right. Now, regarding the, you say, well, what about this, this conjunction, un, that word? I'm going to get out of this in a second, but I hope there's something I'm saying here that'll help you. Uh, regarding that, here's J. Ramsey Michael says the difficulty, so if you're going to do it that way, then you, you're having it as a backward look instead of a forward look. Okay, then he sent him. So it's like things are going along, you say, then, after that, he sent him. Well, that word that's rendered then doesn't have to be then, sometimes so, now, therefore, Okay, and Michaels is commenting on how you can still have it as a backward look despite the use of that particular conjunction.
Okay, so I tell you this just to know I'm not just trying to slip something by you. All right, it says here, the difficulty is that the connective so un normally carries the narrative forward in the sense of therefore or then, rather than looking back at something that has already happened. Yet, if the notice is taken as parenthetical, that is, as one of the gospel's characteristic narrative asides, a retrospective reference is not out of the question. So a looking back is not out of the question. As we've seen, the writer has a way of introducing some of the narrative asides belatedly. If verse 24 is read as a belated notice that Jesus, having been sent first to Annas, has by now been sent on to Caiaphas, it may simply be an example of the same tendency. So I think that's what's going on. And what, one of the things I found interesting is Gundry, he says, you know, I think Un ought to be rendered therefore. Now, if you say that, you'd say, well, if it's going to be therefore, you'd say, therefore, he sent him. No, no, no. Gundry says, no, it's therefore, he had sent him before. You say, well, how does that work? Well, Gundry explains it this way, and I think it makes sense. He says here, now John remembers that he didn't tell about Jesus' transfer from Annas to Caiaphas. So the present verse makes up for that omission. Therefore means... You readers can conclude from Caiaphas, the high priest's interrogation of Jesus, that Annas had sent him uh, to Caiaphas, right? So in other words, he's being interrogated by the high priest, Caiaphas. So he says, therefore, in light of the fact he's now being t interrogated by the high priest who's Caiaphas, you can then know that he previously had sent him. So even if you render it as therefore, you can still take that aorist tense as a pluperfect. All right? That's all I'm saying about that. Now... Uh, now, as for why John would even mention, you say, well, then why does he even bring up Annas? If he, all he's saying is like a footnote. He says he took him to Annas and then everything shoots over to Caiaphas and the rest of it's happening in front of Caiaphas. Why does he even mention Annas? And Gundry says, but why did John even mention the taking of, An of Jesus to Annas first? We're told nothing about what happened there under this view, right? He just reports he was taken there and then he shoots him over to Caiaphas. Well, then why do you even mention that? Gundry says, an insignificant historical detail? Or perhaps John implies that Annas didn't know what to do with Jesus, had no authority over him, and therefore sent him to Caiaphas, who likewise, though he was the high priest that year, couldn't manage any better than an interrogation that backfired when Jesus took charge. So that may be, in fact, what's going on. It could just be a historical detail or... Uh, you know, it could be implying something that he, he couldn't do anything with him. Now, in 1990, okay, you with me? So where we are, we're in 1990, not too long ago, a very ornate ossuary. Now, an ossuary is a bone box. The way that the, the Israelite, the, the, the burial custom in first century Israel, this only lasted for a fairly brief time, but the burial custom in first century Israel was you would place the deceased, if you had access to a tomb, you would place the deceased on a shelf of a tomb until their flesh decayed off. And then after the flesh is all gone, the family would then go in and collect the bones and they would put the bones in a box and put the box up on the shelf. And then when other family members died and their flesh decayed off, they'd gather those bones up and put those bones in the box. And those bone boxes are called ossuaries. Now, in 1990, a very ornate ossuary was discovered in Peace Forest, which is a place just south of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It was discovered by workers who were building a water park just south of the Temple Mount. Now, this bone box dates to the first century, and it has two inscriptions on it. One is in Aramaic, and one is in Hebrew, and those inscriptions may be translated Caiaphas and Joseph, son of Caiaphas. And you say, well, what's up with this Joseph thing? Well, interestingly, Josephus, who is a first century Jewish historian, he gives Caiaphas's full name as Joseph, who is called Caiaphas of the high priesthood. And inside this ossuary were the bones of six 
people, including a 60-year-old man, which is about the age of Caiaphas when he died. Now, many scholars are convinced that this is, in fact, the ossuary of Caiaphas, the very high priest who's uh, examining Jesus here. For example, Jonathan Reed and John Dominic Crossan, these are no conservatives. Okay, these are not evangelical types. And he says here, there should be no doubt, this is in 2001, the discoveries in 1990, they write this in 2001. There should be no doubt that the chamber was the resting place of the family of the high priest Caiaphas named in the Gospels for his role in the crucifixion. And it's very likely that the elderly man's bones were those of Caiaphas himself. Now, some scholars kind of balked. They were a little reluctant here. They resisted this because they weren't convinced that Caiaphas is the correct translation of the inscriptions. Okay, but the case now seems pretty much closed. Craig Evans in 2015, a book he wrote, he says, several archaeologists have identified the Yehosef Bar Kaifa of the Ossuary with Joseph called Caiaphas of the narratives of Josephus, that first century Jewish historian, and the New Testament Gospels. Although some scholars have expressed reservations, wondering if instead of Kaiapha or Kaifa, the name should be vocalized Kofa, Kufa, or even Kaifa, the discovery of the ossuary, subsequent discovery of the ossuary of Miriam, daughter of Yeshua, son of Caiaphas, bearing an inscription that refers to Kaifa as a priest, has, in my view, settled the matter in favor of the Caiaphas identification. So you had many people on board saying, yeah, this is Caiaphas. You had some people balking, holding back. But like Evan says now, it seems pretty much uh, clear that this is, in fact, the ossuary of this very high priest. And I just find such things fascinating. You know, just to hear, here we have it right there. Now, John reminds his readers, he reminds them that Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people, right? In chapter 11, verses 49 to 50, 51. So, you know, this guy's already saying it'd be a good thing for this guy to be dead. Now, how would you like to be appearing in front of him? Okay, well, who's going to decide your case? The guy who said the best thing could happen was for you to be dead. Okay, so that's what you have here. As Leon Morris observes, he says, here was no idealist ready to see that justice was done, but a cynical politician who'd already spoken in favor of Jesus' death. I think that's why John sticks that in there. You see, just a reminder, by the way, you get the flavor of what's happening here, right? This is a railroad job from jump. All right, now the other disciple was known to Caiaphas, and therefore because he was known to Caiaphas, he was allowed into the courtyard of his house, and Peter stood outside at the door and the other disciple then goes over and he speaks to the servant girl who's in charge of letting the people into the courtyard and was basically one of these he's with me type thing you know he's okay he's with me and so she lets Peter in and at some point the servant girl said to Peter now the synoptics indicate that when this actually went down was probably when he's standing near the fire this doesn't specify Says, just says, who said it? It's the girl, who's at the, who, the girl who's at the door. So at some point, this servant girl said to Peter, you too are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And that's the right way to, to render the text, that it's this idea expecting a negative answer. Uh, you, you, you won't see, so you can see how it invites, it invites this idea of saying, nah, nah, I wasn't, you know. Here's somebody who's already assuming that's not me. And, and just, you know, inviting me to say that. And so Peter goes along and says he was not. And I thought Morris, Leon Morris was insightful when he says, Peter, he says, he may have, he may well have been nerving himself to face some stiff opposition. Like in his mind, he's saying, what am I going to do if Caiaphas or some of these powerful people come up and say something to me? How am I going to handle that? He says, but instead... He was asked a simple question by a little slave girl. The question suggested a line of, you weren't one of them, were you? I, you know, I, I, but, but, you know, reassure me, you, you weren't one of those. 
And so he says here, the question suggested a line of escape, and Peter gratefully took it. Almost certainly he did not reflect where it would lead him, and that's how lying is. You see, it just seems so easy. I could just, I could just divert this just here, but no. You do that, you see, and you set a course. And he says, almost certainly he didn't reflect where it would lead him. Once committed, he must have found it hard to go back on his denial. You see, even just for personal pride, to be there and have to be exposed and say, I'm just a liar. No, 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 you're right. When you asked me that, I just flat out lied. You see, that's how, that, that's the, the, how this works. And so I think that's, that's probably uh, something that was going on there. Now, the high priest uh, servants and the temple guards, they'd, they'd made a fire because it was cold. And they were standing around it, warming themselves. And Peter, no doubt because he was cold, but also because he didn't want to be conspicuous. You know, he doesn't want, it's freezing or whatever, cold people are gathered around. And he's the lone man over here. So I have no doubt he's cold and he wants to be over here. But he also doesn't want to stick out like a sore thumb and draw attention to himself because he's one of the Lord's disciples. So he joins them. And this is when Caiaphas questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus doesn't mention the disciples in his response. He doesn't want to throw negative attention on his disciples. And regarding his teaching, he told Caiaphas that he taught openly in the synagogues and in the temple so one could learn what he taught simply by asking the people he taught. And he says, you know, I'm asking you about your teaching. He said, well, you know, look, uh, I have taught a lot. You know, I've taught in the synagogues. I've taught in the temple publicly. If you really want to know what I'm teaching, you could simply ask those people. And as Morris suggests, Jesus may have been making a legal point here. He could have been making a legal point that the Jewish law required the accuser to bring forth witnesses to corroborate the charges that the accuser was bringing. It wasn't the accused's responsibility to prove his innocence. And in that innocence and in that light, Jesus was saying that witnesses to what he taught were readily available. What are you teaching? Well, you have to prove what I'm teaching. And I'm telling you that there are plenty of witnesses that you could bring who would tell you what I've taught. If you're searching for that kind of thing. So Jesus wasn't claiming, by the way, that he never taught his disciples privately. What he was saying is that he didn't have two kinds of teaching, right? He didn't have a harmless teaching that he gave the general public and a very different teaching that he gave to secret revolutionaries. He's saying, what I've taught, I've taught. You could go find out what I taught because I've taught it in the synagogue, I've taught it in the temple. He says, you can just go and ask. Now, one of the guards who's standing near Jesus, this person judged the Lord's response as insufficiently contrite. He didn't like the way the Lord had responded, so he slaps him in the face. And he says, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus then calmly told him, to point out what was wrong with what he said, right? What was wrong with what I said? And if he couldn't do so, well, then there was no justification for having struck him, right? I mean, this guy, I just look at the Lord and his control and things. Somebody smacks you in the face. It's easy. It's easy to lose your mind, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to just go crazy. And the Lord, this guy slaps him and the Lord simply says, well, let's see here. Uh, Was there anything wrong that I said? If not, if I simply spoke the truth, then why did you strike me? So Jesus was speaking truth, you see, and he's thereby exposing the corruption of the proceeding. That's what he, he just exposes the corruption of what's going on. This is a rigged thing that they're after him. And then back at the fire where Peter and the others were warming themselves, 
Peter was again invited to deny. That's how it's put. He's invited to deny that he was a disciple. You're also not one of his disciples, are you? And he took up the invitation saying, no, no, that's not me. I'm not one of this guy's disciples. And then one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the person whose ear that Peter had cut off, he kind of raised the suspicion level. Other people going, hey, you, you're not one of these guys, are you? No, I, you know, I think I'm, I'm wrong, but you're not one, are you? No, no, no. Well, this guy raises the suspicion level. He says, mm, didn't, I see you in, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Mm -hmm. Right? He kind of raises his hand, but Peter again denied it, and the rooster crowed at that moment as foretold by the Lord in chapter 13, verse 36. Carry on. 18, 28 to 38. It says, Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not, of this, is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. What is that purpose, Lord? To bear witness to the truth. <laughs> for this purpose, he says, for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Ooh, <laughs> good, good stuff. All right, so it's in the early morning. The early morning, Jesus is led to, uh, he's led from Caiaphas's house, where the synoptic gospels inform us that a kangaroo trial of the Sanhedrin had convicted Jesus. So he's led from that to the headquarters or the residence of the Roman procurator, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And the Jews who are bringing him there, they don't enter the governor's headquarters to avoid ritual defilement that would prevent them from eating the Passover. Okay, so for Jews, entering into a Gentile's house was considered to be ritually defiling because the Gentile who pays no attention to Jewish ritualistic requirements about clean this, clean that, uh, so if you enter into the Gentile's residence, you undoubtedly are, or you are presumably contacting things that are going to ritually defile you, and they didn't want to do that. He says to eat the Passover because they did not want to, so they wouldn't be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So they weren't referring, John is not here referring to the Passover proper the actual meal that was eaten before, the meal that, that is eaten on the evening of Nisan 15. He's not referring to that, which uh, fell on a Friday that year. That meal had been eaten some 10 hours earlier, as it had been by Jesus and his disciples. You remember they've already had the Passover meal. That's not what he's talking about when they say that they could eat the Passover. Passover. 
Rather, John is using eat the Passover. They don't want to be ritually defiled so they could still eat the Passover. And what I'm saying to you, that's not referring to the Passover meal proper on Friday, the one they had eaten 10 hours before, but rather what it's referring to is to celebrating the feast of unleavened bread. That's what he's referring to. Passover, you have Passover, which is followed by the one week long feast of unleavened bread. And these two things are basically fused together. They are seen repeatedly simply as a, an event that's tied together in the first century. Uh, they're referred to this, this feast of unleavened bread is so connected to Passover that it's seen as one thing that it is called the Passover. Unless you think I'm making that up. In Luke chapter 22, verse 1, it says, Now the festival of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. Okay, so this is what they're talking about. They don't want to be defiled because they don't want to be precluded from being able to participate in the celebration, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is commonly known as the Passover because the two are connected. Right, so that's what they're talking about. Now, Pilate asks for a statement of the charge they're bringing against Jesus. He comes out and he wants to know, uh, what are you doing? What, what are the accusations you bring against this person? You're bringing him to me for a ruling. I have to have some kind of judicial determination. I want to know what is the accusation you're bringing. And the Jews say to him, in essence, trust us. And he, I mean, he wants a charge. He wants to know, he wants to know the Roman law that has been violated. And they basically say, trust us. They say, look, if he were not a criminal, if he weren't a perpetrator of evil, then they wouldn't have brought him. (laughs) Hey, what charges you got? Hey, man, if we didn't have some good reason, we wouldn't have brought him here. That may be. But what is that reason? I want to know the reason. And so that's what it is. So Pilate then assumes, you see... From, from the, what they say to him, I want the charge, and they blow smoke. And they said, if we didn't have a good reason, we would have brought him. So Pilate then assumes that their complaint against Jesus is not a violation of Roman law. Because if it was a violation of Roman law, they'd, they'd have ponied up with that. He asks for it. They give him nonsense. So he assumes it's not a violation of Roman law. So he tells them to handle the matter themselves. You see, he tells them to judge him by their own law, regarding which they had considerable latitude in administering. So he sees this as some kind of religious kerfuffle. And he tells him, he says, listen, you go ahead and you judge him then. You take him and you judge him by your own law. And they then reveal that their goal is nothing less than his execution. Okay, so that, that now they're, they're tipping the hand saying, mm, we're after big stuff here. Our goal is that he be executed, and they're not allowed formally, the Jews, to administer the death penalty. And so since we want him killed, we have to come to you. And this fulfilled Jesus' words, indicating that he would be crucified because only the Romans would employ that form of execution. So remember, Jesus has indicated that he's going to die by crucifixion. In chapter 3, verse 14, chapter 8, verse 28, chapter 12, verses 32 and 33. So this fact, you see, it's, it's going to, when it says here, kind of death, he's going to die. He's going to be put to death by Romans because only Romans administered crucifixion. And Jesus has already indicated that he was going to die by crucifixion. Now, hearing the Jews' intention and recognizing the importance that they attach to this, because we want to kill this guy. So hearing that and seeing the importance that they attach to this matter, Pilate goes back into his headquarters and he asks Jesus, he says, are you the king of the Jews? Now, that suggests that though it's unreported by John, the Jews had in fact brought a charge of treason against Jesus. They represented that Jesus is a rival king to Caesar. He is a political threat to see a competing king. 
to Caesar. They had indicated that to him. And implicit in Pilate's question is whether Jesus poses a political threat. When he says, are you the king of the Jews? He doesn't mean, are you the king of the Jews in some kind of religious context? He means, are you a king who has an army and who has a political rule who represents a threat to the power and the authority of Caesar? Because that is how they have presented Jesus to Pilate. So that's what he's asking. That's what's loaded when he says, are you the king of the Jews? And so that's what's implicit in his question. Is he a political threat? And in asking, so Jesus then asked him, in asking whose idea that was, that he was that kind of king. Okay, so what's implicit, he's saying, are you a political ruler who poses a threat? And so in asking him, where'd that idea come from? Was that your own thinking? Or are you being played by the Jews who gave you that idea? You see, that's what he wants him to think about. Are you being co-opted? Are you being played by those Jews? And Jesus veiled balking at the characterization of his kingship Well, that reinforces, so he says, are you this kind of king that you're being said to me to be who poses a threat to Caesar? And Jesus says, hmm, did you come up with that or is that kind of how they're trying to paint me? See, so he has this veiled balking at saying, yeah, that's the kind of king that I am. And that reinforces the suspicion that the accusation that's being brought against him by the Jewish leaders, that it's rooted in a religious disagreement about the nature of the kingship. You see, I heard that bell. About, see, so that's, it, it reinforces, okay, so Pilate's smelling out here. This isn't really a charge against a Roman law that we've got. So there's something else going on here. There's something going on, because he's familiar with these religious disputes. and we got. So he's smelling here. This is a religious disagreement about the nature of the kingship. And if I had more time, and I really wish I did, but I don't. Lord willing, two weeks from now, pick back up. Brother John, next week, Lord willing, deprogramming the atheist. Thank you.